and it could happen to me. Remember, we must ensure that the word which we will be passing on to the next generation should be the one that is friendly, liberal, protect, protective of private property rights, and full of opportunities that will create a prosperous society. Thank you so much. Indeed, we are here to work towards a possible of removing these administrative barriers. I think it deserves another round of applause. So before I call on the next person to deliver the solidarity message, I have a list of dignitaries here I would kindly acknowledge. Um, I have Honorable Francis Xavier Sosu, he's the popular MP for Medina. Please give him a round of applause. We have Ni Bote Afote. He's the chief of Otino. Ni Afote, chief of Otino. Correction, thank you. John Bratton from SNET, general manager. Leslie Bote from SNET. And I also have William Brew. He's the head of. on message Kwabena Kumi he's the Distinguished me to ride upon the existing protocols that has been laid already. The Palace Center for Transformative Society, a non state actor, pro system, and community improvement think tank, lended our support to our compatriots in the social re-engineering space, that is ELAPI, to prosecute this all-important public interest subject. As a non-state actor entities, we do reckon that we do not have the mandate of the people to make changes. However, we take solace in the fact that we can, we can, we can cause change by alternatively proposing to the powers that be when the gaps are identified. We have therefore identified some systematic gaps which need urgent attention in order to remove or minimize the impact of poverty. We have also observed that the social safety net of our nation leaves much to be desired. The rich continue to be richer, and the poor continue to be poorer. This is unacceptable. We are therefore here to ignite a civic leadership and innovation initiative to spark a national conversation and hopefully to have changes effected. On this note, we want to wish each one of us a, a, a powerful conversation and an impactful deliberation. Thank you so much. That was brief and short. Um, so I'll take presentation of speeches, and in order for me not to be coming back, please, we'll take it in this order. Um, Mr. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Isaac Tetenubo, Esquire. He's from Voxtra Legal Services. He'll do the first one for us. After we have Honorable Francis Xavier Sosu, Member of Parliament, Medina Constituency. Ms. Salome Braima, Deputy Registrar, Beth and Death 
Registry Ghana and Mr. John Kwejo Boateng, General Manager, Ben National Insurance Trust, SNIT. And then from Access Bank, This guy worked all his life, did not chill. He would save the money and say, I'm His other brother inherited, but was it of in in. Brother, in God, it's meant for you to watch. We are hoping presentation we will realign our. Is in which we can. Building on the topic, which through the use of the next of kin approach, education. Honestly, we cannot emphasize education. Why? or mission of next of kin. Education obviously will see and of course colleagues from the AG and We as lawyers, how can we use the next of kin system to reduce poverty? We intend to do that by providing a fee system and firm wide policies which are intended to balance the skills between us, the lawyers, and then the applicants. Finally, both presenters before me spoke about institutions and where they have been found lacking. We intend to provide situations or scenarios where institutional proactiveness will preempt even the existence of dormant accounts to begin with. Preempt the existence of dormant accounts. All right. Now, of course, we all know what a nest of kin is. Usually it is the closest living relative. Of course, depending on where you find yourself, as one judge said, if I live here to go to the north to work and I'm filling a form, I may enter a nest of kin who is a friend who can easily be contacted in the north. But usually, nest of kin refers to one's closest living relative. Now, and we are getting into stormy waters here. 
the specifics of determining next of kin and inheritance, which of course we refer to Ghana as succession, it differs by jurisdiction. But we all know because of our matrilineal and patrilineal systems, specifically in Ghana, geographical location is also very much at play. Now, since the 5th of July 1985, that was when PNDC Law 111 was promulgated, we know that succession is now regulated by law. Previously, it was customary law, and it could take any shape. In fact, PNDC Law 111 is special in one instance. Should a disease have passed before 1985, when the law was passed, but the case involving the person's estate was still pending. As at the time PNDC Law 111 was passed, the estate could now be determined under PNDC Law 111. Suffice it to say, in 2023 and beyond, should a person die interstate in any of the instances referred to by the first speaker, it is PNDC Law 111 which will regulate the estate. Now, uh, we have to pause here and take another look at PNDC Law 11 because it has a lot of ramifications for what happens on the ground, customarily, I mean. Please go on. Okay. So, on account of PNDC Law 111, if you are nominated as a nest of kin, you cannot refer to you as a successor of the deceased. If you are nominated as a nest of kin, you cannot call yourself the inheritor of the property of the deceased. And please, this part is very important. We know what happens in our towns and villages. Once someone passes on and another person is nominated or elected as the next of kin, quickly they take the law into their hands and start getting rid of the widow, the children. Please, on account of PNDC Law 111, you cannot do that. Okay. And of course, you are not the heir. But you are not the beneficiary as well. Now, of course, once you are nominated as a nest of kin, you could be a beneficiary. And the law has made steps for you to proceed on to make you a beneficiary. But the fact that you were nominated by your past family member as a beneficiary does not automatically make you Him and then put down a person as a beneficiary. This lecturer joined the scheme. He put down his mom as a beneficiary. When he passed, his mom attended to get access to the monies that he had put down as a scheme contributor. The court said no. And this is why the court said no. You see, and that's the second point. I will really want us to concentrate on that second point. It says, the High Court said, the sole purpose of a nomination of a next of kin in a supernatural scheme is to assist the university authorities in tracing the members of family of a diseased participant. Honestly, if you do not live here with any other information. I would really want you to live here with this. First and foremost, the sole aim of a family member putting down another person as a nest of kin is for this purpose. And indeed, please go on. As you can see, uh, let me apologize for using my left. 
is because of how the place is standing. As you can see, this decision was made in 1973, before the passage of PNDC Law 111 in 1985. The view that the High Court uh, made in the first point was affirmed on appeal by the Court of Appeal, because the mother of the disease went to the Court of Appeal to challenge the High Court decision. And the decision was affirmed. But look at the very last two lines. 2010, the Supreme Court had occasion to pronounce on a next of kin. And they went back to 1973 to adopt the ruling given by the High Court. So there's no controversy at all. If you are nominated or elected a beneficiary, a next of kin, it doesn't make you the successor, it doesn't make you the inheritor, you definitely cannot have access to the deceased person's property. Very well. Now, good. But the story is not that cut and dry because Usually in insurance schemes, they put the word beneficiary. They put the word beneficiary. Now, this is what section 14 of our Wills Act says. I've highlighted the important points in red. It is saying that if there's a life policy, so first of all, there has to be a life policy. Not only that, the value of the policy is expressed on the face of the policy. So you, you can see there, 50,000, 20,000, it is expressed on the face of the policy. Then, and it is obviously for a benefit of that person's family. In fact, here there may be a, an issue. Should you make a member of your family your nest of kin? But that's for, <laughs> that's for us to get across when we get there. <coughs> So a member of that person's family, unless it is expressly revoked by a will. Okay, let me go back a bit. So this sentence is saying, even when you name Richard Ama as your beneficiary in your policy with SNIT, you could, in your will, revoke that clause. And on your death, Richard Niyama will not get what you are owed under SNIT. So even when the benefit is expressed, unless it is revoked, unless he makes a will, let me ask, what happens when there's no will? When there's no will, then obviously this beneficiary will take whatever was left to him or her. And this is also why my previous slide as to what does not equate to a nurse of kin is very, very important. Very well. Now, of course, SNEETs and the insurance companies, even Momo, they are not the only uh, institutions that provide policies. So how then do we determine in a particular instance whether or not you are a beneficiary or simply a person to be contacted in the case of any eventuality. And that is provided down here. As long as the nomination does not align 100% with the dictates of Section 14 of the Rules Act, you and I, we are just people or persons of contact. You do not take under that policy. Okay. Now, at the very top, I've written next of kin, customized as sex beneficiary. Let's not forget that the passage of PNDC Law 111 does not actually do away with our customary notion of a customized successor. The passage does not cancel our practice of having a customary successor. Good. If it does not, what avenues, when we realize that next of kin, customized successor beneficiaries are not necessarily inheriting the property of the deceased, 
What avenues are therefore available to such persons? And this is linking very correctly into how we intend to fight poverty using the nest of kin system. You see, of course, I've talked about Plenty's Law 1-1, I've talked about the Wolves Act. Administration of Exodus Act 1961 as amended. Section 9 says discretion as to grant of administration. Section 79, sorry, Section 79 of Act 63 gives the court absolute discretion in deciding who to give letters, to grant letters of administration to. I want us to take a minute to reflect on this. A court can decide on who to grant letters of administration to. So getting the grant does not per se have to do with rushing to go to court at the death of your family member. It does not. OK. Now, please, yes, come again. Look at order 31 rule 13 of CI 59. CI 59 is known as the district court rules. When you go to a district court in a civil matter, it is CI 59 that you use. So if you go to a district court for letters of grants, letters of administration, this CI 59 is what the court will use. Order 66, rule 13 of CI 47. CI 47 is what we use in the high courts for civil actions. If you go there for the grant of letters of administration or even probate, it is order 66 that will come into play. Now, those two orders, rule 13, contain the very exact provision, the very, very same provision. No change at all. And they make, this is the priority it lists for the grant of letters of administration. Surviving spouse, surviving children, a surviving parent, and then number four, customary successor of the deceased. Customary successor of the deceased. Now I ask you this, if we know in our towns, in our villages, in our houses, in our homes, that these four persons, by order of authority, are the persons to whom letters of administration can be granted, then we know, conversely, that should any of these persons rush to the court for letters of administration, without the participation of any of the other groups, the court, in exercising its discretion under Section 79 of Access 63, may refuse to grant the letters of administration. So what's the rush? Why should I, as a son of the deceased, rush to the courts for letters of administration without involving my family or without involving my head of family? And in fact, some seniors have argued, some senior lawyers have argued that it is on account of number four, that when you go for a grant, the courts insist that your head of family must also swear an affidavit that indeed you have been given the power to come before the courts for the grant of administration. Okay, move on. Now, should the preceding slides be accepted and appreciated by all of us, what will be the outcome? Well, first of all, customized successors do not take matters into their hands on the death of a family member because they will know that whatever they do, should the case get to the courts, it will be set aside. And it happens all the time in our courts. It happens because of misapprehension of the notion of next of kin. That is why we say that education in this regard is so important. The education must seep down into our rural areas for them to appreciate that just because we are customized as sexer, 
the property is not yours. It simply isn't. Of course, same way persons who have been nominated as next of kin and are beneficiaries will not appropriate the properties involved. Now, better and wider consultation and agreement among families, four letters of administration are applied for. Because if I'm a nest of kin with SNITs, Peter is a nest of kin with Glyco, three of our other siblings are nest of kings, none of us will be rushing to the courts. We'll come together because we understand the process. And then when we do apply for the grant, it will be once and that will be for all. Okay. Of course, collaboration and then reduction in the frequency. Okay. Reduction in the frequency of other family members filing to set aside grants or caveating against the grant to particular persons. Now, let me ask a question. Which of these points does not include money? Does not include the expense of money? You see, when a customer successor or a party nominated takes the law into their hands, it will re result in the fifth point. Other family members will go to court to set the uh, grant aside, or when the notice are pasted for 21 days, come to court and caveat. So even though we agree in this room that uh, institutional blockages could affect the financial standing of the family, these are steps taken by the family members themselves which lead to the very same outcome, the depletion of the estate. That is why we should not be like the first and the two, instead we should be like the three and the four, so that in the end, monies expended out of the estates will be kept to a bare minimum. Okay, this is the conclusion. If persons nominated or appointed as nest of king beneficiaries and customized successors appreciate the legal consequences that flow from said appointment or nomination, money is expended by the family itself, which money is only deplete their estates, will be kept to a minimum and be enjoyed by all persons entitled to share in the estates. I want to make a very humble plea here. When we leave, let this information, let this education live with us. Let us share it with our families, our friends, anybody we come into contact with, because this is honestly the only way the family itself can save money. And you'll see from the other points, none of the other points is within the power of the family. This is the only point, this education, and then taking actions on account of that education, through which the family can save money and then reduce the poverty within the family. Okay. Now, let's come to the lawyers. I'll be very brief here. We all know lawyers like money, so I won't talk plenty. Now, that first point. <laughs> Remuneration for legal services must measure up to the value of the time spent or value created as determined by the economic environment in which the service is provided. That is a direct quote from the Ghana <laughs> bar scale of fees. It says that when we create value, we must be compensated ap appropriately or proportionally. Well, that is true. But look at the second point. Statutory charges are not within the control of a lawyer and should be borne by the applicant. All right. Now, statutory charges are like tax charms, filing fees, and things, so we cannot go there. But we, at the law fair, this is what we've adopted. A basic payment amount, it can be as little as 1,000 cities, and then a percentage of the value of the estate. Should the applicant agree then this will be by the family, and that will be that. Okay. Okay, pro bono service, of course, yes. Okay, let it come. Okay. 
and is to be undertaken by the whole firm and the applicant's family. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now I read the <laughs> the directive by the Bank of Ghana. After two, in fact, you can go to the next slide. After the next slide. Yes. Okay. So accounts that have remained inactive for two years move into a reserve account, and then after three years, they are to, supposed to be sent to the Bank of Ghana. The question we are asking. Let's just come. No, let's just go up. And please look at the very last two points. The bank is supposed to publish on its website and in two daily newspapers accounts that remain dormant for five years. I do not know who in my little village of Ningo will be reading the newspaper or visiting the websites of all the banks in Ghana to ascertain whether or not my dad's or my mom's or any of my family members' accounts has been dormant. And this is even worse. Should I find out that one of them's accounts has been dormant, I have to make legal, I have to take legal steps to make claims for the funds by presenting all relevant documentation. I don't even want to go into what that will cost and the inconveniences associated. So we ask this question. This is the question we ask. How will a next of kin or beneficiary get to know that the deceased family member transacted with a particular institution? How will we get to know? We provide some answers. Now, this is a circular. This point two is a point made by Ghana, Bank of Ghana in one of its circulars. It asks the question, did you know your next of kin could be contacted by a financial institution when all efforts to reach you fails. Go on. But you see, that question by Bank of Ghana is silent on time frame. Is it a two years? Is it a five years? When is that? When is the contact going to be? We have a very simple solution to that. We suggest, first of all, that the financial institutions or the SDIs, they should take the proactive step of contacting a next of kin within six months of inactivity. Inactivity is defined by Bank of Ghana as the absence of withdrawals or deposits. So this is what we are proposing within six months. But moving forward, when these institutions are onboarding persons. Look at this question. It is the simplest question to ask. After how many months of inactivity should your next of kin be contacted? I would say two months, because I use my accounts quite frequently. If two, after two months I haven't touched it, there's a, pro there's a problem. Some people use it very infrequently, so they'll say after six months. But just the existence of this question will put a stop to all the dormant accounts. Just that question. So we are urging, I know Access is here, I know SNIT is here, I'm sure other financial institutions will pick this up. When you modify your, your processes, please, simply insert this question, let the account holder or policy holder answer it, and then work in line with it. The issues with, with dormant accounts will be a thing of the past. Finally, and this is my conclusion. I told you what we as Vox trial lawyers will do. Graduated skill, pro bono service, and no. What if not all, your, all lawyers sign up to that? What if some financial institutions sign up to asking that question, but some don't? That is why we are saying that the buck, the buck stops with the family. The education of the family the steps taken by the family to reduce the poverty associated with the nest of kin system, it is completely in their hands. And like I said, should any of the above two refuse, it is only the family 
that can reduce the poverty related to the next of kin system. Thank you very much. I will also beg to stand on the protocols that um, has already been established um, and to say that when my colleague was talking about pro bono services, I was reminding Nana that <laughs> pro bono services are good, but in this country, Nipa a Cobra. Uh -huh. Ghana for do do na ya cobra. Nti se ya si se efidie chi aboa ni sonko na uyi ni susu ana dania asemfufuo. But you know, like the Bible says, we will not be tired of doing good uh, because at the appropriate time, God Himself will reward. So, thank you for what you do uh, at the Vox Legal Services. Mine will be a very brief remark, thank you. Um, and I am looking briefly at how administrative barriers contribute to poverty in Ghana and looking at the human rights issues associated with um, family poverty when it comes to succession. And basically looking at what we're doing here and the eventual outcome of what we're doing here. Um, I believe that the human rights issues associated with uh, succession are very, very obvious to all of us, particularly when it comes to uh, inheritance laws that sometimes discriminate on grounds of gender, ethnicity, and depending on which um, family you are coming from, whether you are matri matrilineal or patrilineal, uh, how you could be disadvantaged. Uh, it is important for us to accept the fact that it is because of removal of the inherent uh, or the systemic challenges associated with our traditional way of inheritance that the PNDC law 111 was enacted. Thankfully, thankfully, uh, I was part of the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee meeting that is currently reviewing the PNDC law 111. And so most of the issues that we are raising here, a number of them are being addressed under the PNDC Law 111. And I'm hoping that um, dialogues like this would help some of us in Parliament and in this space where we are working on uh, some of these laws deal with um, the issues or the concerns that are being raised here. Now, it becomes worse when properties go into litigation, you know, or a deceased person's property goes into litigation. Uh, the issues of rights that are associated with them sometimes can be unbelievable. And I don't know whether it's because um, either the nest of case or customary successes don't feel the impact or the effect of leading an entire estate into litigation when there are beneficiaries. Sometimes, particularly when there are children and there are elderly people who must be catered for, and you see people strongly, you know, opposing each other. And I've done a number of administrative uh, succession matters, and they never, never end well. It's always a pain, and the administration, the, the estate is never, ever administered because of a number of caveats and a number of... <sighs> so it, it's quite sad when it comes to um, administrative of estates in these matters. Uh, thirdly, you would realize that access to justice generally is a problem in Ghana when it comes to administrative of, administration of estates. My colleague is talking about um, the services they render. I think one of the areas where 
legal services is so expensive is when it comes to administration of estate. So anytime people come to me, you, you really want to help, but it's expensive. In fact, even when you are going to court to do LAs, um, sometimes the, the, the tax component of the property, people do not have the money, they don't have the means. And so it becomes very, very difficult for them to um, properly have legal representation, and that makes it more difficult for them. And today, I am particularly happy by what Ilapi is doing because administrative barriers, in fact, what I've talked about, when you put all of them together, it amounts to administrative barriers. All things being equal, if you pass away today and your properties can just move directly to your beneficiary, you don't have a problem. But we have a system in place that makes it more difficult for people to benefit. You know, for example, the nest of kin issue we're talking about here. You look at how complex the, the, your, the forms, the bank forms are, even when people are filling them. How many of our farmers in the villages, when they are filling these forms, understand the effect of this, these forms? Our market women in the, the, the market, how many of them understand the complexity of the forms they are filling when they have to nominate people who will be their nest of kings? So these are um, some of the things. And it's so important that this conversation will resort to a more simplified you know, approach of people getting benefits when their families uh, passes or when their beneficiaries and their, people's, uh, uh, their family members estate. Now, if you look at the length and complexity of our bureaucratic processes also, the length and complexity. And in Ghana, every office that has to do something has become so, so corrupt. And I can't say it any other how. Whether it's a birth and death registry, a passport office, wherever you go today, to transact in public good, you need to pay people to do the, the work they've been, they are paid to do. And so it becomes, it becomes so worrisome when somebody is no more and you have to take steps to redeem your own property. And so uh, that's one of the things. And then the cost of legal, uh, the, the, uh, legal costs and then the procedures also. It's, I believe that we can... One of the benefits of digitalization is to simplify most of these processes. So I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to use digitalization as a, as a, 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 a tool to further simplify these processes. Now, every policy formulation begins with agenda setting. So what we are doing here should not end with simply having a conversation. We should be able to move the conversation beyond setting the agenda into a policy formulation. And so it is important that we have a total overhaul of our, or in, in our rules. I mean, the Bank of Ghana would need to set clear standards that will simplify the whole concept of next of king and how people benefit from next of king. It shouldn't be left to banks to decide which form they have to use uh, when it comes to or what should be their narrative on, on forms when it comes to nest of king? I think we have to develop a standardized approach across board. And these will require the support of the Office of Attorney General, the BOG. If we need to make amendments to our banking law or Special Depositors Act, or we have to set up a new legislative regime that deals with uh, these matters, I believe that it will be important for us to do, the, to do so. So on this note, I want to commend the organizers of this event, and I hope that our deliberations will lead to a major policy shift when it comes to nest of king regime in Ghana so that we can build a better society. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Well, we've heard from two speakers. We have some few more speakers to go. Indeed, we should move from just this dialogue. I'm actually expecting to see that we'll get these reforms restructured. We'll take a speech from Ms. Salome Braima, who is the Deputy Registrar for Birth and Death Registry Ghana. 
after that we have Mr. John Kujo Boateng, General Manager Benefit SNIT, and uh, Mr. William Brew from Access Bank. So please follow in that order for me. Please give her a round of applause as she comes. Very good afternoon to everyone. I would also like to stand on the existing protocol. Um, I came across these words by Sydney Sheldon, which states that being poor is only romantic in books. The opposite is catastrophic and indeed an empty pocket and hungry stomach is enough to better explain what he meant. Ladies and gentlemen, human dignity became the central became a central principle of international law and human rights and universal declaration of human rights adopted by the United Nations in 1948, declared that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Why then should we allow family poverty and society to create all kinds of inequalities among us? Let's not forget that poverty is, let's not forget that poverty is not natural, it's man-made. Ladies and gentlemen, please permit me to state that our bureaucratic processes and structures make the acquisition of services cumbersome in some of our institutions to the public. This, in effect, renders some of the institutions inactive. Aside this, we mostly forget to perform our civil responsib responsibilities as citizens of this country. And even when we do, we do not do it so timely. Please let me share some light on the topic that touches on both emotional and partic practical aspects of life, assessing the fun of diseased relatives, the role of birth and death registry. The birth and death, the birth and death registry was established by law to provide accurate, reliable, and timely information on all births, deaths, and future deaths occurring within the boundaries of Ghana for socioeconomic development of the country through their registration and certification. The law, starting as Cemetery's Ordinance of 1888, was to register only the expatriates who happened to be our colonial masters for their relatives back at home to assess the benefits of the diseased. The law witnessed its first amendment in 1891, and in 1912, it became the Birth, Death, and Burial Ordinance. Fast forward, the Registration of Birth and Death Act at 301 of 1965 came into being and has been replaced with the current one, the Registration of Birth and Death Act at the Registration of Birth and Death Act 2020 at 1027 with its LI 2436 2021. In all this, that registration was not left out. This shows the importance the nation places on the registration of debt. The birth and debt registration which the seamless interaction with the registry is paramount. Ladies and gentlemen, 
accurate and timely registration of debt is very essential. of individual officials, the police and the magistrates. A prompt and precise registration process facilitates facilitate the steps involved managing the financial affairs left by left behind. Sorry. The birth and death registry also serves as the gateway for legal processes related in inheritance in the state estate management, ensuring that the registry records are up to date and easily accessible, streamlines the legal procedures, allowing families to investigate the complexity of inheritance with great ease. Moreover, collaboration between financial and insurance institutions and death and debt registry is imperative. It's imperative to secure channels for the transfer of information, ensures that accessing fund is smooth process while safeguarding against potential fraudulent activities. I thank the organizers of this program, and I'm very glad to see all relevant stakeholders present at this gathering. It gives me hope that we shall all look into the loopholes and strengthening processes towards reducing poverty for the better of our citizens, because you and I have a role to play successfully. In conclusion, Ladies and gentlemen, the Birth and Death Registry stands as a vital organization in the process of assessing the funds of the disease. Its efficiency, accuracy, collaboration with other institutions are vital for, easy, for easing the burden of grieving families. Together we can build the system that not only honors the departed, but also provides solace and practical support to those left behind. Thank you for your attention, and may our collaborative efforts lead to more compassionate and efficient handling of affairs surrounding the end of life. Thank you. Kindly note that all speakers should try and make it within 10 minutes for us. We actually have a dialogue, which might take longer. 10. Well, I'll just skip most of my slides. <laughs> I wonder why, when it got to my 10, the, the time has been there. Can I, can I get that? Well, it puts some kind of pressure on me. Not 20? Anyway, good, good afternoon, everyone. Please permit me to also stand on existing protocols. I'm from SNIT, John Boatin, and I'm here to represent my management, which is led by our Director General, Dr. John Oforitan Gray. Uh, given the time that I've been allotted, I might have to uh, skip some part of my presentation and uh, delve straight into the topic that was given to us, where it talks about assessing funds of diseased SNP members. Um, before I go into details, I want to clear something. Um, if you have my uh, letter friend, you may be wondering, because I'm an old one, uh, give a, a very succinct definition of uh, Ness of Kin. And uh, I would like to say that if you have chance on our law, Act 766, you scarcely will see Ness of Kin in that law. We have been using beneficiary throughout for special reasons. Because of the 
confusion surrounding that word, nest of Cain. So Snet, we hardly use nest of Cain. When you are filling our forms as a new member, instead of nest of Cain, we even ask for contact person, making it a bit wide. And as I go through my script, you, you see that it's so easy to make a claim as Snet than maybe any other area. Once you know your way around, even a friend who cares about you can take it upon him or herself to go and lodge a claim or even report your death as death and that fellow will be heard. All we need is for the fellow to direct us to at least one member of the diseased member. Then we take it out from there. So let's go on. Who is, uh, who is handling the Okay, let me quickly rush you through this. SNET, as you all know, uh, we uh, are governed by an act of parliament, the National Pensions Act of 20, uh, 208, Act 766. We are in charge of the first year, which is a mandatory basic social security scheme. Then uh, you know about the second year, the third year. Um, we administer this basic uh, uh, scheme as I've said. And uh, membership, anybody working in the formal, informal, and self-employed sector can join state. But the caveat is, if you have a, a, a fresh member, you should join at the age of 15 up to the maximum age of 45. The reason being that in Ghana, uh, compulsory retirement age is age 60. So if you don't join early, let's say you come at 45, 46, meaning you are short of one year, you can't qualify for your pension. You only do 14 years. That's why the law said you should come b between 15 and 45 years. What do we do as state? We provide cover for loss of income of workers, through payment of monthly pensions in the event of old age or permanent invalidity and death. Um, we also, let me take you through our processes. We register employers and workers. Employers, uh, we register them because some people work with companies. Before you can be a member, we should register your employer maybe John Boatin and Co. Limited. Then my worker is uh, Kofi Mensa. So we can easily identify you under that employer. But should you leave that employment and become a self-employed, it's the same social security number we gave you whilst you were working with John Boatin and Co. that you're going to continue to contribute into. So you get one social security number for life. Then we collect your contributions, invest the excess funds of the scheme, then when it gets to the time for us to pay you, we process and pay to eligible members and nominated dependents. Then we manage our members' records, your data, your bio, your financials, we manage them. Um, so a few statistics here. As of now, we have 1.9 active contributors in state, the whole country. Uh, and the breakdown is as follows. We have the private sector uh, taking care of 61.08%, which is about 1.2 uh, workers. Then the public sector, uh, 708 plus, representing 36.02. Then the self-employed. You know, uh, until recently, when we started, you know, have you heard about our new seed? When we, we launched seed, we only had about 14,000 self-employed. Within one year, barely one year, we've added on, now we are at 57,000, which is an indication that is gaining grounds, and a lot more people are understanding the benefits that the scheme offers. Um, that's how the, the, the three tier looks like. We are the base, uh, when we collect every month, 13 and a half percent, it's the other from uh, and a, a member's salary, 
of which 11 per, uh, is given to state to manage for you towards your pension. And out of that, the 13 and a half, two and a half percent is ceded to uh, NHIS to take care of your uh, health insurance. Then, second tier, you're supposed to have five percent uh, paid to your, your, your corporate trustee. That one, uh, your company or you, the individual, you have a choice to determine who should be your corporate trustee. The third tier is that the, the, the third arm of it. That one is uh, I, I would, it's also voluntary. Eh? The other two are mandatory by law. But the third tier, if you still have funds to, to spare, you can go find a third tier operator and we have most of these insurance companies and uh, private schemes operating on form of pension. Uh, over there, you can also contribute as much as 16.5 of your earnings to top up your pension. What does this tell us? It tells us that with the uh, passage of this law, we have three areas of which you can get some funds when you retire, state being the basic. Then the second tier coming in to support state will pay you monthly pension on retirement. You know, here that state was paying monthly pension alongside lump sum. But when the law was passed, as services this was passed, they took away the lump sum aspect from SNET and gave it to the second tier companies or the uh, fund managers to operate. So this time when you retire, we pay you your monthly pension. Then the second tier operators will pay you your lump sum. And if perchance you went for a third tier, they will also pay you some form of lump sum as a top up. So these are the benefits that state offer. Old age pension, invalidity pension, survivors lump sum, and we have immigration uh, lump sum for foreigners who are working in Ghana. They also wanted to be part of it and they are, they are seriously uh, uh, partaking in the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cake. Then, should you not be able to qualify for old age pension, you will be paid old age lump sum. I hope I'm clear up to this point. Okay, so now, what do you get when you sign up to SNED? Up to 60% of a member's three best years average advance salaries are paid to you as pension. We, for a want of time, we can't go into all those, but maybe when you have time, you can contact us and we'll give you much details on that. Uh, the scheme also assumes longevity risk. Why do I say so? When you are a member of state and you are on pension, even though uh, per Act 766 the annuity period ends at age 75, should you be strong and uh, you live long even up to 150 years, state is obliged to pay you to 150 years or 200 years. So all you need to do is take very good care of yourself. You're, you'll get bonus till you die. And uh, the, the good news is that every year, pensions are indexed and increased. So the longer you live, the better it is for you as a state pensioner. Then pensions are increased as even the annually to maintain purchasing power of pensioners. Then we also pay invalidity pensions for people who, for some reasons, were unable to continue with their journey of work. You might fall sick uh, along the way. You might be engaged in uh, some accident. And when the medical board doctors certify that you are uh, unable to engage in any gainful employment, they will advise us they will put you on pension. You might even be 20 years, 30 years, and that one will continue paying you till death. We, there's an inbuilt life policy, and this is where my topic uh, will, will, will be centered. As you sign on to that, more or less you have signed for a life insurance. Should you also pass halfway, then your beneficiaries will be called and be paid survivors pension or lump sum. Money will be paid to them as you directed us. So like I said when I started, when you are a member, we give you a form to do your own nomination as if you are writing a will, which will be uh, sum up to 100%. So if you have five children, you can give them on your 20, 20 apiece. If you decide to get, make it 10, five, it's, it's, your, it's, it's, your, it's, your, it's, your, it's your choice. But it should sum up to 100%. Then we have the immigration benefits for people who are non-Ghanaians. When they are leaving, 
uh, whatever ha has accrued to them with uh, the, the uh, interest, which is very good, is paid to them. So uh, the other benefit you get, once you're a state member, you don't go and pay, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, when you are renewing your NHIS, you don't pay. Uh, what, what, what? Premium. Your premium. Oh, I hear what you only pay is uh, processing fee of uh, six cities or so. All because state every month gives some money on your behalf to NHIS to cater for all that. Then we've done some analysis. You can see when you are a member of state, the money you get from us in the long run is superior, it gives superior value as compared to most of the investments we have in this country. Because it's a long term payment. So if you sit down and start asking, so how much have I received from state since I went on pension? And probably you, you want to compare with, maybe if you put it somewhere, you see ours is superior. And we have proof. Maybe tomorrow any of you can come to me and I will show you proof. Uh -huh. Move on. Now, to my, there, there are a whole lot of misconceptions about what we do as state. And that's why we are here today, to clear some, if not all. First of all, people say state members' contribution and benefits get locked up when they die. And I think it sits with this uh, topic we are discussing today. But I'm here to tell you today that members and pensioners' funds don't get locked up with state. The reason being that state pays survivors' benefits to validly nominated dependents including minors, nominee, and other nominees who may be included, even through court order. Should somebody, maybe a child, be uh, uh, unnominated by a parent, and he feels that he was a dependent of the parent while the parent was alive, he or she has a right to go to court and ask for inclusion. And we will wait for that court order and argue. So it's so flexible. Once you think you can make a case in court, to be included, we allow that. It's under misconception that still delays processing of benefits for beneficiaries. And the answer is we pay benefits to survivors within an average of 14 days after the death is reported to us. If somebody has recently come for a claim, I think the fellow will bear testimony. In the past, yes, I admit, it used to delay, but now we've all gone high tech, Everything is, uh, we, we're using uh, uh, technology, we're using uh, 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 modern gadgets, so we did record time, you are paid. State benefits are low. I, I hope people have heard that. If you know the highest paid pensioner in this country, as we speak, every four weeks, if you say one man is too long, receives 1.6 billion plus cities, Ghana cities, from us. 1.6 old billion. You see it? So, you'll be wondering why, what he did. Yes. The fellow was a businessman. If somebody can earn such and that much from a scheme, then he tells you, if you, 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 you put in much, you get much. The, the concept of our, our scheme is that the more you contribute, the more you get. If you contribute low, you get low. So I will urge you, those who control your own funds, try and improve on it year by year. And you can be assured of very good uh, uh, pension at the end of the day. If somebody is taking 1.6 old billion, every four weeks we pay the fellow. And there are some, a lot of people in the region of 500 million. Think is low. Good if you also enjoy it one day. There's this misconception that you cannot assess survivor's benefit with, without letters of administration. SNIT, letters of administration are things that we, it will be a, 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 a document, we don't even ask for it. 
Because what we need, we have various things that we, we, we ask for. And that's about the last. We don't even need it. If you bring it, fine. But if you don't, we have even uh, documents like you can provide any of the following to assess benefits as state. Death certificate. Madam from uh, Beth and Death will, will, will attest to the fact that we work in close collaboration with the department. All we need to do is to certify ourselves that indeed the death actually has happened. We at times get instances where people try to uh, do things. Somebody might be alive and you find a child in Accra trying to claim a, a benefit for the father who is alive in the village. And the old man would not even be aware. So that's how come we always want to go a step forward uh, and, 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 and confirm some of these things. You can also come with letter from even your employer. It's enough. Your employer works with you. And if your uh, HR manager says you are dead, indeed you are dead. You understand? <laughs> your religious said, your pastor, we accept all that. So you don't go spending money on uh, 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 Ellis. Your pastor, we respect your pastor's uh, 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 signature. John is no more. What more do you want as an institution? We will go by that and pay you. Police report. We accept those ones. Medical cause of death, like, uh, like um, the ones Madame and uh, people issue, doctors issue, we accept them. And lastly, if you had money and you decided to go for uh, LA and you brought it, oh, well and good, but we will not insist on LA. We will not. Get any of these. We will pay you with them. Then there's another misconception that you need a lawyer or a middleman to assess the benefit. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need a lawyer to assess any benefit as it. You walk in and you'll be assisted. So please, don't go to my brother for him to charge you. Come. Everything that we offer as it is free. Snit, nothing. We don't take money for anything we do as it. Everything. Every service we offer is free of charge. You only walk into any of our offices and tell us what you want us to do for you and we'll be able and willing to assist you. There's another misconception that if you don't know the disease member's state number or still, uh, still keeps the money and contribution, it's never true. What, how do we identify somebody? You come, yes, that my daddy is dead. Unfortunately, we can't find any of his state documents. We have the records there. You help us with the, your daddy's name, age, or date of birth, some few information, maybe parental, whatever. All we need is to zero in on that particular person. If we query for four John Boatins like me, chances are that three of us will come from a particular region, then we go further, we go to a town, eventually we'll, we'll, you, you zero in on the one you are talking about. They will know this is your, your daddy you are talking about. We will we'll take it out from there. Am, am, am I clear on that? You don't need to, to say because you don't have a document, you can't go to SNIT. You can always come to us and be ready to assist you. How do you to qualify for uh, uh, survival slums? Okay. You are paid when a member dies in active service or a pensioner dies before 75, we pay you that lump sum. How to qualify for lump sum? Um, you should have contributed for a minimum of 12 months. Pay attention here. You should have contributed for a minimum of 12 months within 36 months prior to your death. What is as good as this? You are a member of SNET. All you need to do is be an active member for just 12 months within the last three years. With them, you see. But if, let's say, the last three years, you have not even paid anything, eh? that means you are not an active member. Should you die, there's a way we will pay you. Eh? Uh, you will not lose anything. But if you die as an active member, the benefits are good than the one who is an active member. That, that one is true. If you are a member of a group and you are not active, 
do you think the benefits do you will be as good as the ones who are active? So you all try to be active members. Uh, there's an inbuilt life policy, as I've already said. That's what we pay to your kids. Let me share some statistics with you for you to see that SNET is not holding on to people's money. Rather, if there's any institution that we need to praise for fighting po uh, poverty in this country, SNET should be singled out as one of them. Ladies and gentlemen, just 2018, the benefits we paid to people who died amounted to 258.7 million and it kept rising. This year alone, the year hasn't ended. As of September, when I pulled the, 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 the data, we have paid 488.3 million this year alone to people's beneficiaries after they had died. This is different from the, the pensioners who are alive and we are paying them so that they will not be destitute. So it means we deserve an applaud, if, if for nothing at all. These monies <laughs> are being paid to people who have died, they are, they, are, they are dependents. And I'll show you the next slide. Please go on. There are now people who have benefited. Had it not been for that those people would have known what to do. 2018, people who are reported dead to us were 8,464. And the beneficiaries for those 8,000 people were 28,884. Look at the number of people that are depending on us. 2019, people who were reported death and we processed for their benefits were 7,924. And their dependents or beneficiaries were 27,394. Fast forward, this year alone, the year hasn't ended. We have had 11,581 deaths reported, and we have paid 23,512 beneficiaries. So ladies and gentlemen, like I said, state is doing a human's job in this country, and all we need is your encouragement. This is another uh, uh, process chain. Uh, for one daughter, let's move on. Now, areas that we all need to assist us try to, to, to uh, reduce or even eradicate. You see, possible causes of delay in processing survivors' lump sum. All we have signed up to do is to make sure when somebody dies, we pay accurate benefits and in good time. Or if it delays, the money will come at a time you are already even dead or you don't even need it. We have to pay promptly and accurately. So there are certain things that we encounter that we want to share with you so we all will help us to, to, to reduce them. So people fail to provide evidence of death. You come to me complaining about death of a relation. You don't have anything to show. It will be very difficult for me to assist you. Because you have to help us help you. All the things I've enumerated earlier, like death certificate, at least you get any of them, a letter from employer, religious health, police report, medical cause of death, any of them suffices. So please, uh, help us educate our uh, members out there. There are some too, who uh, fail to update their nominee information whilst they're alive. If you look at our law, we say at least if for, you, you, you forget, you don't want to do it every year, every five years, go and check and see how your nominee list uh, look like. We often encounter instances, at times some of them are sad. The fellow joins net when he had not married and placed his girlfriend's name there, the, the active girlfriend at that time. Later on in life, he got married has a missus and children for God to come. That girlfriend is somebody's wife today. Something happens to you, you go and pull his records. You ask who is Ajua Mansa. Hey, Ajua Mansa was his girlfriend who? Missus and the children now have to resort to court. Why do you put your family in such a situation? If you are not careful, and Ajua Mansa is also the litigious type, say yes. The guy did it in his right senses. So if for nothing at all, I deserve 
a portion of it. And trust me, she will end up getting a percentage because she was nominated. She was duly nominated. And you see your father's money going to somebody's wife. <laughs> it shouldn't happen to us. So, ladies and gentlemen, occasionally, pass by, let us tell you who is on your nominee list. And there are some. Your, your, your last one, the last ones are always forgotten. When you start a family, first you are put there, you added a third child, and you are a baby last, baby last. Meanwhile, you are forgotten about baby last. But for children's acts and other laws in the country, that baby last would have lost. Because if tomorrow you pass and your adult children are wicked, they will tell baby last, daddy loved you, he would have put you there. He gave us 50 50. So go we'll and see him at the cemetery and ask for your portion. So please, the nominee is very important. Let's take it very seriously. There are other people who are also very litigious family members. They, the moment you pass, if, uh, I don't know whether he sees himself as next of kin or whatever, he wants to go and create a problem. But the good news instead is that we rely on your nominee list. Anything uh, short of that, we resort to court to give us direction. So you don't have any problem there. No death of kin will come and worry you. Madam says my time is up, but it's getting interesting, but don't worry. Let's move on. Um, let me give you a few takeaways. If you don't remember anything, remember these ones. The SNIS scheme is very good. Like I said earlier, what you put in determines what you get. Benefits are predetermined and guaranteed by law. We as net, we don't massage anything. Whatever you get, there's a formula already uh, fixed in the computer. We put it in, it works out your distance for you based on uh, the, the, what you put in. Like I said, number three is still is, uh, hammering on the update of nominee information as often as possible. Still pays you survivors labs now upon application. You see, uh, I may not know you have lost a relation until you come to tell us. So, like we said, anybody from the family, even a friend can come and report. All we need from you is to come and tell us when the contingency happens. That is all we need from you. No funds, and I repeat, are locked up with SNET. Once you qualify and apply, the benefits are paid to you. Please, you can pick these numbers, contacts, uh, in case you have anything uh, as net. Uh, it will be on the, the screen for a while. Contact us, and we'll be more than willing to assist you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, kindly permit me to um, ride on all existing protocols. My name is William Brew, um, the Chief Conduct and Compliance Officer for Access Bank. Um, I'll do well to stay within three minutes so that we can close. <laughs> OK, so um, just. Three things I want to talk about. One on the um, dormancy process. My, my seniors have spoken a lot about it, so I don't have to go into details, but um, just a few things I wanted to update um, everyone on uh, about the fact that the Bank of Ghana expects banks to publish names of dormant accounts before these um, accounts are transferred to the Bank of Ghana. However, before that, there are a whole lot of processes that um, we go through before the fifth year that we are required to transfer these funds to the Bank of Ghana. The, the same guidelines also um, ensure that banks are um, sending information through all available channels. And these are the emails, the telephone numbers provide the doing account opening, as well as information on nest of kin. 
And that is something that uh, we are at Access Bank, we have done uh, well in our account opening packs. Um, the standard requirement is that you have the person's name um, there. However, we pick the name, the phone numbers, the address, even the um, municipal assemblies that these people exist in. As much as possible, we want to have information that can link us to the person that we can contact to in case we need to um, get in touch with the, um, our customer. Um, I think the problem we face in doing that, also some of the speakers have spoken about this already, is the fact that doing account opening, probably somebody comes with a friend to come and open an account. So next of kin, they just put their friend's contacts there. And um, some of the information that is even being collected to people even have a problem with you asking them to provide nest of kin information. And so during that time, they also, all they did is an account. I need an account number, give me an account and stop asking all these questions. And so it's very important now, when we are opening an account, we should do what to provide this information, correct information, just in case we need to um, get in touch with you. Also, another process within the bank is that every customer that we have onboarded, um, we, are, we profile the person with a specific risk assessment. And so, from what we do, on six months basis, customers who are, we, we term them as high risk customers, we will review their information that they have given to us. In that process, we take advantage to review every information that we have collected on them in the past. Um, low risk customers um, probably will, will do a two year or a three year uh, review on their information. So this is also something that we also do to ensure that at any point in time we have live information on our customers. Um, the other thing, information that we also um, collect is um, we have beneficiary owner information. What that means is that um, at any point in time, we want to know who else controls the funds that you as a customer, you are opening an account with us. So you are at liberty to also provide that information for us. For you know, you are saving the money for, um, let's say, on behalf of another person. And so we get that information so that we want to have an idea of who has a right to the funds that you are bringing to us as well. So when you pick our account opening packs, you also have that information. The appeal is that if you, um, when you are completing these forms and then you are asked these questions, just do well to provide as much information as you can for the bank to know you as um, the law requires us to do. Um, the final thing I will say is that um, the nest of kin, as a bank, because of data protection issues, we are not required to share any other information with the nest of kin. And as um, my friend who is Leonard indicated, um, the person is just a conduit for us to reach you. And that is the only information that will tell you that this person has an account with us and we are trying to get in touch with the person. So it's not any person that we are going to give um, information on. Um, finally, what I would like to say is that um, as a bank, in all we do, we have the customer's interest um, at heart. And this is shown in our activities and in the products that we offer customers. And then in our processes, we always want to get close to our customers as much as possible. And I must say that this dialogue is very important and we are very much aligned to everything that will lead to the benefits of our customers. Thank you very much. That was concise. Thank you so much, Mr. William Brew. Um, take, we'll take a, um, a, spe a speech from Mr. Stephen Danso. He's the head of research at Ilapi. After that, we have a documentary that's on a field work on what victims go through in assessing funds. I am, I am actually of the, or I'm, I believe that this documentary would actually bring out 
whatever we are talking about to light. And we also take a life experience. So people will share their experiences. Then we zoom straight into the round table dialogue. So. Thank you very much. Please kindly permit me to stand on the existing protocols. My presentation will be brief, and I'm going to focus on the findings in regards to the challenges that the nurse of kin and the beneficiaries face when assessing the funds of a disease relative. I'm going to look at the introduction where I will talk about what necessitated the study. I'll also talk about the objectives, the study focus. I'll move to uh, methodology, and I'll move to findings and recommendation. The working class of Ghana is about 31.95%, which means that the rest of the 68% depends on this 31% for survival. And this puts a lot of pressure on the working population. And according to the multidimensional poverty index, 45.6% of the population are multidimensionally poor. And currently, the World Bank indicated that about 800,000 800, people have joined the poverty line. So the question is, how then do we address the issue of poverty? In addressing the issue of poverty, we have to look at the unexplored approach or areas over the years to addressing poverty. So as an, institu as an institute, we decided to look at the nest of kin and the beneficiary, how they can assess the funds of the disease relative. During the research, we realize that there are various challenges associated with the process when it comes to documentations, it comes to administrative barriers, and this wasting the inequalities and also affects the economic prosperity of the victims. So what is the objective? The objective is to investigate the legal path and documentations where we have the clear understanding of the legal requirements and the various documentations needed for the process. We also examined the structures in terms of bureaucracy, and we are looking at the cost, we are looking at the duration, and the number of institutions you have to interact with. And we also look at how this institution has contributed to poverty. So what is the study focus? The study focuses on the SMIT, the insurance, and the banks. And when you look at the subscription form of the various institutions, you realize that the SMIT has the nest of kin and the nominees. The insurance has the nest of kin and the beneficiaries. But when it comes to banks, most of them has only the nest of kin and not a beneficiary. So another question, Robert, if the account holder is no more, who becomes the beneficiary? So in assessing a disease-related fund, there are certain important things that we need to take into consideration. That is, do you have a will or you don't have a will? So when you have a will, then it means the person has died test it. But if you don't have a will, then it means the person has died interstate. So when the person died interstate, then they need to apply the interstate succession law, PNDC 111. Of course, the, our learned colleagues or our learned senior lawyers has talked on that, so I will not move to that aspect. But when it comes to insurance and SNEs, they use what we call the contract terms. So not necessarily the interstate succession law. 
So with this, you have a contract with these uh, institutions. So once the person is no more or you are no more, it means the beneficiaries and the nominees on the subscription form will be paid according to the contract or according to the terms and condition of the contract. So if you say they should pay AMA 10%, Kofi 20%, that is what they are going to do. So in assessing a, a fund or in assessing a fund with a will, then you have to go to the court and attain a probate. But without a will, then you have to go for LA. And before you acquire an LA, you also need to submit various documents to prove that, yes, you are the one who is eligible to get the estates. And this makes the process a bit cumbersome. There are numerous laws when it comes to property inheritance. But in the case of interstates, we we'll focus more on the administration of estates and the interstate succession law. The interstate succession law actually came into existence to keep the injustice that women mostly face when the man dies interstate. That is when the man dies without a will. So the law came into existence to keep that injustice and give women and children the first to benefit from the assets. So what is the methodology? The research is an exploratory research which used the investigative approach. And purposively, we selected the nest of kin or a beneficiary who has been through the process. And by extension, they are able to recommend others who has also been through the process. That is the snowballing. And the data was collected both quantitatively and qualitatively. So we move to the findings. This is where the focus is. The study indicated bureaucratic structures in terms of the cost, in terms of the duration, and in terms of the number of institutions you need to interact with in the process. And it also revealed the information gap and the growth of dependency. So when it comes to cost in terms of bureaucracy, the respondent indicated that they spent an average of 7,550 Ghana CDs in the process. So the question is, if you cannot afford this money, it means you will not be able to go through the access, and by extension, you cannot get access to your money. In terms of duration, most of the respondents, about 51.3% indicated that they could only assess the fund after a year. So uh, this is, when, when you are in the process of assessing the fund, and unfortunately, you are no more, or you passed, then it means the person to, who has to start, or who has to replace you, needs to start the process all over again. And this can be challenging. So the duration is too long, and there is a need for us to look at how we can reduce or streamline it. So when it comes to the number of institutions you have to interact with, it depends on the, the situation. So when the person dies at the hospital, they have to go to the health facilities for cause of death, the medical report. Then when the person dies in accident or uh, in the house or at home, then you have to go to the police for corona. It will also state the cause of death before you proceed to the birth and death to register your, your disease. You also need to go to a district assembly where you get the burial permit, the court obviously for probate and the early. 
before you proceed to the financial institutions for your claims. During uh, an investigation, they may require a letterhead and order of service from the religious leader. So you must be able to get that too. So this means that there are a lot of institutions you need to interact with in the process. And this makes the process very difficult, especially if you don't have the financial muscles to go through their process. So we ask the citizens, or we ask the respondents, how easy was the process? And about 95.2 of them indicated that the process wasn't easy. And out of this 95.2, about 71 percent abandoned the process, and only 24 are still in the process. In terms of uh, information gap, 80.5 percent of the respondents indicated that they were not aware they were the nest of kin. And also, 63 percent indicated that they were not aware of the amount of money the disease had. And same 63% also said they, are, they were not aware of the amount they are entitled to. So the question is, if they don't know how much they are aware, if they don't know how much they have in the account, they don't know how much they are entitled to, then how then do they authenticate what they are giving from the financial institutions? We realize that having a real makes the process very easy. So we ask them whether they have a real or not. And about 85.5% of the respondents indicated that they don't have a real. That is approximately 90%. So this implies that nine out of 10 Ghanaians do not have a real. Nine out of 10 Ghanaians do not have a will. And there are various reasons for them not having a will. Some of the reasons are um, they are not ready to write one. They don't know about the will. Some of them indicated that the asset is a, a family asset or a family property. And the one interesting aspect is some of them were of the view that it is not yet their time to die. That is why they don't have a will. <laughs> and not having a will can lead to inheritance fraud, where you have to rely on others in the process. And by so doing, they may maybe get the, the, the funds without you knowing that they actually have the funds. So what is the effect of this on spouse, children, and family? We have the economic effects, that is the livelihood of the people will be affected. And when it comes to education, their inability to assess the funds means that there is a likelihood they could not pay their children's uh, education. And once they cannot afford to pay, then obviously there will be school dropouts, which could also lead to teenage pregnancy, it could also lead to streetism, and it, it could also lead to child abuse. So what is the health implications? They may not be able to pay for healthcare services, and the long-term effect is that when they are living in a rented apartment, and it is time for them to renew their rent, once they are not able to afford, they have to leave the house. So the cyclical of poverty continues, and their economic life is being affected. Recommendations. So as an institute, we recommend that there should be frequent public education by stakeholders such as the NCC, 
the financial institutions, insurance, SNIT, and others on the processes and procedures involved in the process. The administrative process, uh, proce processes must be streamlined to reduce the duration of assessing the funds of a disease relative. We as a Ghanaians also have a role to play here. We must inculcate the habit of registering our properties and have a written will to avoid the setbacks, the nest of kin, the beneficiaries, and the nominees face. The, the government and the Bank of Ghana should also consider a new policy that plays national identification card or the ID card number as a prerequisite requirement for registering a nest of kin, beneficiary, nominees in all financial institutions, insurance and SNIT, to help authenticate their identity during assessing of a claim or benefit to avoid impersonation. Then again, the Bank of Ghana and the stakeholders, especially the financial institution, the banks, should make the payable on debt form available and accessible when creating a bank account. In conclusion, I would say once many do not have a bill, it means a lot of Ghanaians will die interstate and face the same cycle of bureaucracy, which will further contribute to pushing them into poverty. Hence, there is a need for collective effort from all individuals, institutions, and government to look at policies to reduce the bottlenecks or the bureaucracies of the process. Thank you.
denying them the joy of having their loved ones now diseased taking care of their daily needs. Quaranti, Mabriki. He said, Not me, Mr. Benjamin Scanu, not me, the Abraham. As he can come on and be the Abraham, and he's a Mabriki. When loved ones pass away in Ghana, assessing their remaining funds is often an opaque, frustrating slog from an spousal nest of kin. The White Region National Survey, conducted by the Institute for Liberty, Policy Innovation, the LAP, helps shine a light on the confusing democratic maze and lack of transparency that ordinary grieving families must navigate. A comprehensive study gathered candid insights from over a thousand respondents across all regions, ages, backgrounds, and income levels nationwide. Their pungent experiences pin back the layers on a complex system that seems designed to keep rest of kin uninformed and powerless when a relative dies without an airtight will. The team at Elaki took a trip to interview victims institutions, legal experts, professors, and lawmakers in order to seek first-hand information on the issues surrounding access to the deceased relatives' funds by the nest of kin. Thank you. 
to get some documents from the court. So one of us did this. I will be getting an official notice from the assemblyman of the electoral area. Then the chief and the pastor of the area as well. I got everything before the processes. We started the process and then out of now as I talk, I have not had the death certificate yet. Mr. Samuel Ibrahima, Deputy Registrar for the Deaths and Deaths Registry. Share small light on some of the processes and documents needed to acquire other documents such as the death certificates. We have the work of us all death. We have to proceed to the death. We needed to call the head of the family, two principal members of the family, to for an assistant to the children's children. Then the next of kin who also swear secrets of the So after that we came in and I believe that even the law of that was the first part. We bring an ID card, we talk picture your name and everything now. We give us a photocopy of that, we talk on prints and your telephone number. Then when you bring that video to us, if the person was a Muslim, the video is not enough. We have to get a letter from the imam that officiated the burial ceremony. If upon all this, the officer is still not okay, the officer has the right to ask you to go out to the community and get a letter from either the chief or whoever released the burial grounds for the burial. We do all this to protect ourselves as officers, to protect the family and protect the most of you as well. Because you can easily use the death certificate to take any benefits or whatever. If the person was a Christian and it takes registration, we still go to that process to get affidavit and everything. This one officiating a uh, Roger Minister has to give us a letter head. The acquisition of these documents and as may be requested, the only means by which the nest of kin or beneficiary can access funds of deceased relatives for institutions such as SNICs, insurance companies, and the banks. Most often, the stress and wastage of resource in an attempt to assess these funds makes the nest of kin or beneficiary abandon the process, thus hampering prosperity in the family. A member of parliament for the Medina constituency and a human rights lawyer, Honorable Francis Xavier Susu, also called for the review of existing laws in order to unify and simplify the processes involved in assessing a diseased relative's estate. So the question is, what piece of legislation can give us a general um, solution 
or a unified solution to the problem. And in my view, that may have to come through policy and, and law. Uh, we may need to amend our laws or um, enact um, a law specifically dealing with processes by which, I mean, beneficiaries access their benefits from statutory bodies and other private institutions. <laughs> I am hoping and trusting that um, I can get access to my father's benefit for since and it shouldn't delay, it should be fast enough so that myself and my siblings will be happy. The inability of beneficiaries and nest kin to assess the funds and estates of deceased relatives have led to dependency, family poverty, and the twaddle of efforts by individuals to take themselves out of poverty. Despite the technical challenge, I want to believe we all paid attention to the documentary. So we will zoom into the roundtable discussion. We should please try and keep it as short as possible, and then we'll be able to get out of here in due time. To help me do this, I have very distinguished personalities who are very tall profiles. So permit me for want of time, I would summarize their profiles. I have Anatu Ben Lawal, and um, he is he's an enterprise business development practitioner with over 20 years experience. He's creating, she, sorry. <laughs> She's creating SME solutions across 15 African countries. Currently leads Social Innovations Africa, a social enterprise enabler and think tank that is focused on researching and driving the enabling policy environment that would leapfrog Africa into the fourth industrial revolution. I also have Professor Enoch Opoku Enchi. He has a tall list, and I would also try and keep that very short. He's the Dean of the Business Administration and comes at, at the Academic City University College, Accra. Prior to that, he was a professor of leadership and management of Vertible University. Wisconsin, USA. He holds a PhD in business organizational leadership from Indiana Wesleyan University, Indiana, USA. He has an MA in science in business organizational leadership from Mount St. Joseph University, also in the US. He has written seven leadership books and has authored many articles. I also have Ms. Salome Breimer, who is the deputy director for Beth and Dead Registry. And I, would, I also have Mr. John Kwejo Boati, whom you heard him speak early on. Mr. Ebenezer, the Esquire, you also heard him speak. I don't think I need to introduce him. He's a lawyer, so. <laughs> and we also have Ms. Ophebia Ramatu. She's a gender advocate. And, um, okay, she's a gender advocate. So they would help me do the roundtable discussion. And please... Permit me to acknowledge the presence of Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansam. Please, if he's here, can you please give us a wave? Okay, you're welcome, sir. So, um, basically, we've all heard from, we've had speeches, we've had research work from Ilapi. Um, from my panelists that's helping me do the, dis the discussion, what would you say is the way forward for us to build, to actually find a way to merge or do away with the administrative barriers we have. Um, I'll direct my question to Professor Enoch Opokuenchi. Please, can we get an extra mic? Thank you. I think uh, listening to all that went on, the solution is very simple. Uh, one 
If you look at the LA, four individuals have access to it. The surviving spouse, the children, the parents, and then the customary successor of the deceased. So quickly, let's take that person out, the customary successor of the deceased, because I buried my father on October 21st. And the person who is supposed to succeed my father, there was a fight on it. Because everybody in the family wanted to be. And because of that, the chief said he's put his stomach on it until one year. And that means that we'll all have to wait one year to see what will happen. So that head of, you know, the family could be somebody who never contributed anything to the family. But yet the law says that that person should be part of the process. Why not take that person out? And then we'll be good to go. That is my suggestion. So in policy, let's take that person out to avoid that confusion. Two, I saw that, uh, you know, poverty did not start from yesterday. But we have to make policies to make sure that people will not be further poor. Education is part of every solution. By in educating our people, we have to change the system that is not working. So if the red tape is too long, why don't we shorten it? I returned from The Hague uh, three days ago in Amsterdam. The president don't have a place to sit. He goes, find every space, and sit. That is what they are doing now. Even libraries, they've abandoned libraries. There are no libraries at the universities. They have made it open collaborative space, sit anywhere and learn. So the administrative thing is killing us. So as we talk about anywhere you go, you have to pay something. Traditionally, we have what we call gift giving. So if I go to Nana, I have to present something. I can't go empty handed. Now we've turned that tradition to gift demanding in public institution. And that is practically corruption. So let's take that one out. Then we'll have peace in our neighborhood. The other one I wanted to talk about is the percentage. You see, you are a lawyer. The person's parents are dead. They are already struggling. They are paying legal fee. And then you are also telling me that you are entitled to a portion of the estate. What did you contribute to that estate? That you want a portion of it? So let's look at that. If we can fix legal fees, make it low, make sure that all those, you know, whatever the lawyer is charging, fix it. The state can fix that amount. Then we know that the poor person can also afford it. If you cannot afford it, the legal aid will come to your help and then fix the problem. But these lawyers, the way they are playing some games, you know, with the little money left for these poor people, I have a problem with that. All right. The other one that I wanted to talk about is the... Uh, how we simplify the forms. So the form that anybody had to go through from the Bank of Ghana or the banks, let's make it just one page. So that you get a form, it's easy to fill the vital information, and then we move forward. I think that we're supposed to make will mandatory. We have to make all wills mandatory. I don't know when I'm going to die. You don't know when you're going to die. So at certain age, you know, if Senate is saying that from 15 years to 45 years, you need to start contributing, why don't you make it mandatory that you make a will so that whatever you have left, there will not be any controversy? Thank you. Good contributions there. Um, I will direct my next question to lawyer Ebenezer Isaac Tainubo. So, um, wills are supposed to be mandatory, like he's saying. And in your submission, you talk about education. Um, I want to believe from the research to, it was very obvious most of, most of the people they interviewed did not know they have to actually have a will. Some also asserted to the fact that they don't have properties. So if you are talking about education, what are lawyers in court supposed to do to help the ordinary Ghanaian to understand that there's a need for you to have a will? All right. Uh, <clears throat> so something happens with the prison services. Uh, often there are individual groups that go to the prisons to educate them on their rights, look through their cases, see which ways they can be reformed to help society. It is not too difficult 
In fact, it's quite easy to have a group of lawyers located throughout the country who are willing to dedicate their time and act in connection or with the NCCE to educate uh, artisans, farmers, any of our uh, people in the, in the rural areas. So, you know the AG, for instance, has offices all around the country. Ghana Bar Association has lawyers all around the country, and Ghana Bar Association knows where we practice, the regions we are located. It will be very, very easy for the two associations, I mean Ghana Bar Association and the National Commission for Civic Education, to join forces so that any time there's a need for any outreach whatsoever, a lawyer is in the midst to answer questions that may come up and to educate the populace on, on any area of the law, actually, yes. It, it's quite easy to do, yeah. Okay, just a follow-up. Do you agree to the assertion that wills are supposed to be mandatory? That will be a bit difficult, yes. But the education, if it goes down well, people will go ahead and draft their wills without it being made mandatory, yes. Thank you very much. My next question will go to um, Mr. John Kojo Boateng from SNIT. Um, that was a brilliant presentation. I, I learned quite a lot, of, a lot from that. Um, there's this general assertion, or I wouldn't even want to call it an assertion. In my research, I think I even told the director of ILAPI that a lot of Ghanaians would contribute to SNIT, but they hardly tell the beneficiaries that I have put you in charge, like you are one of the people I've listed as a beneficiary. So in their research, I heard them say that some beneficiaries don't even know that they, their names have been put there as beneficiaries. So when that happens, what, how does your outfit come in? Okay, thank you. Um, before I even um, attempt to answer that one, we should try and uh, clarify. I think we find ourselves uh, uh, using nest of kin, beneficiary, and uh, nominees uh, 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 interchangeably, but they are different. They connect different things. But if you say nest of kin, it's an individual. I've not heard of nest of kings before. It's always an individual. And let's also accept the fact that a, a, a nest of kin might not necessarily be a beneficiary or a nominee. I think that, that should be clear. Sure. Then to your question, um, that nominee list we do as net, more or less, is like a will yeah. that you've made to us. We hold this sacred, we keep it in our records department under lock and key because it's your testament. You are saying you have money with us and when you are gone, bring it out and give it to uh, those people who have nominated. Every SNES staff swears to an oath of secrecy from the day you are employed. Should it leak, those people at the records department might even end up in police cells where we may be able to tell that Mr. A or B was the source of the leakage. So we as SNET, as uh, 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 trustees, we have a fiduciary responsibility to keep that secret. And you know the way uh, Ghanaians or Africans, we, we handle our wills. People have different reasons why they don't tell people what they've done. Whether we like it or not, uh, people, we've heard stories of people leaking their wills and the next day they were gone. As whether it was a natural death or not, you and I will not know. So, by naturally, people are tight-lipped when it comes to issues like that. But from our end, should somebody pass, like I said in my presentation, if you think your father has died, and in your view you are, you are a beneficiary, or even you are not, nothing stops you from walking into any SNET office that my father was Mr. So-so-and-so. He passed yesterday. May I know 
whether he has something with SNET of which I'm a beneficiary. We might want to know your identity first. And when we are clear uh, through interview and investigation, trust me, if you're on it, we will let you know. If you're not on it, we will let you know even your rights under the law. If, let's say, you are a minor, we will tell you straight away that there's a law that protects you. If you are an adult, we will let you know that you have a, 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 a leeway under the, a, 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 by going to court for variation of your father's nomination by a court of law, that, because our law allows that. So if, let's say you feel, okay, when daddy was alive, I was depending on him for my sustenance. Straight away, you can walk into any court room, see the registrar, they will start the process, and they will notify us that this pending claim is a subject of a court decision. So hold on for the next, and we have uh, some arrangement with the courts. Any case from SNIT, they handle it with dispatch because they know other people are waiting to get theirs. The courts don't delay on such claims. Once somebody goes in for variation, within a week, the, the, the judges and magistrates rule on it, submit their, 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 their decision to us, and we apply it. So nobody's money gets locked up. It takes one person from the family to come and report. If, let's say, I reported yesterday and tomorrow my sister comes, all we do is, oh, thank God you have come. Your brother was here yesterday. Sit down. Let's process yours. That's how it goes. Or the first person who comes will tell you, oh, where is Asimesi? Where is Kofi? If they are 10 on the list, we will let you go and contact them. If you say, oh, I'm not on talking terms with them, okay, then give us their contacts. And it's our duty to contact the next person, the next person till we exhaust the list on the nomination. Okay. Thank you. Just a follow-up, though. In case um, a nominee dies in the process of in the process of claiming, what happens to the yes. funds? When I, it's a good time for uh, the, the the researcher was talking about not using only the contract. No, we use various laws. There are certain instances where we apply law one one one. We this law one one. That dominee has fallen into intestacy. So we apply law 111 on that portion. Okay, thank you very much. Right. My next question goes to Ms. Brimer. Um, kindly um, help us with how easy or difficult it is to get a death certificate from your outfit. All right. Um, it's not difficult getting death certificates from Beth and Death Registry. Before we start the process, you have to give us evidence of death. Um, this is because we have people coming to report that their relatives are no more whilst they are still alive because they want the death certificate to make claims at the financial institutions. So what we do is, if the person should die at health facility, any health facility, just get a qualified doctor to certify the death that, yes, indeed, this person is no more. So we call it um, certificate of cause of death. So based on that, we'll do the registration for you. And if you have the cause of death, but you bury before coming to our end, it makes it late registration. Um, so even if the person should pass on today, you have the certificate of cause of death today, and you bury today, then tomorrow you come to our office, it becomes late registration. So now we don't have any evidence. The only evidence we have is the cause of death. So with this, you have to go back to court. And um, most of times, when people hear about court, they get scared. So what you do is you can easily go to legal aid. Most of the time we advise them to go to legal aid. And um, with that, the lawyers there, I don't think they charge. They will take you through the process. You bring an affidavit from the head of the family, the nest of kin, and any two principal members of the family. We do this because most of the time we go to court. Why are we in the courtroom? Um, a member of the family will come that, yes, you've issued that certificate to 
Mr. Suso and so, he is not supposed to get access to that for claims. So in order to protect us and protect the rest of the family, we do all this. If the death should occur in the house, then you have to bring coroner's inquest or coroner's report. Then with that, we we'll do the registration for you. You may ask, so if the death should occur in a typical village, what do we do? Um, so you have to bring us an evidence. So what we do is most of our offices, so registration is basically done in the community. So you don't need to come all the way to Accra or go to the district capital or whatever. The nearest birth and death in the community. Just go there, inform the officer. The officer will do his or her own investigation. So officers may go to the family to see whether indeed the death occurred or the chief of the town. When they get those evidence, then they proceed with the death registration. So it's not difficult at all. Okay, my next question goes to Anatu Ben Lawal. Um, I think we've heard a lot. Um, basically, it seems most of the problem stems from ignorance and perhaps illiteracy. Okay. Um, your outfit seems to look at a lot of women issues, if um, I, I want to say it that way. So in which way can we help with education, especially educating widows about these rights? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, this is a very pertinent question. Everything we are, we are talking about we, is pointing to the fact that we need to look at resilience, especially for women, as a topic. This is what it's all about. So for me, I think that uh, as we are discussing ESG, as we are talking about financial literacy, as we are reaching out to different groups, as we are starting our village savings and loans, this has to be a crucial element that is in the middle of it. There are many reasons why women are, are, are this, you know, I just came from Lagos where I was doing a training on financial inclusion. And financial inclusion and uh, uh, um, uh, 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 digitalization. Looking at women and then climate change because of disaster relief. You know, and all these issues. So this is the bigger issue. There are many problems. One of it is the ignorance. And I don't know why we don't, we, we don't insist that this be a part of what banks do. I know banks do sensitization, etc. But I was even listening to um, our, my colleague over here from uh, SNIT. We are 31 million people in this country. Why do only 2 billion people have, you know, that's atrocious and that's very risky and it ensures that the vulnerability levels and indexes are high. So we have to now look at how do we now look at all this, stop all this patching, 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 and make certain things compulsory and work especially through the credit unions, the village savings and loans, social services, etc., to ensure that women understand that these services are available to them. I have tended to work in Ghana and then I'll travel and, you know, so I was a bit, in my, I never really knew much about SNITs. But one day, I managed to find my way there because uh, the way I was working to them, they oh, go and see them and, you know, I always thought it was shrouded. I needed to have so much money, etc., etc. But somebody there just explained to me very simply what the process was. And it didn't matter how little or much I had, as long as it was consistent. And I was wondering, oh, so is this the thing that I've been afraid of for so many years and trying to avoid and, you know, and this is me who, I mean, is seen as somehow educated. How much more the poor woman I work in, the, in northern Ghana. We work all over Africa, but my, my office is in northern Ghana. I've been there for the last four or five years. And I can tell you, when it comes to women and girls, these people are working. They have a lot of money. They have their rural banks. They are, you know. So there has to be a campaign that is geared at making sure, supported by states, supported by the banks, supported by people like Ilapi. But we also really need to look at the social services, the NGOs those who are working directly with these vulnerable populations to educate them and make them realize that uh, next of kin, it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to die and everything has to be a drama at the end of the day. There's also the issue of inequalities and inheritance law and all those issues. So that also seeps in there, that we need to also tackle all those things. But I really, really believe that uh, we have a campaign called Championing Over Violence that we are going to start next year. Ne ne next year. And it's really about tackling these deficiencies within women because you, you listen to them and it's almost as if um, they are helpless. 
but they are not helpless. There are systems in place. Financial literacy, for instance, should have everybody who's training anybody on financial literacy should have this component. When you go into a bank even to open an account or whatever it is, it should be on a form somewhere or one of the things that your relationship officer talks to you about. So I think it's really putting all these things together and saying, you know what, let's stop this aspect. I'm talking about the, uh, the, the gender dimension because I work with women. And let's now look at this thing holistically. And how do we now educate the country and women especially in terms of what they need to do so that they are not left wanting? I've also mentioned the fact that we also need to overcome certain inheritance laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're actually also going to start a research, especially on the Dagomba culture and the things that go on in there around inheritance, inheritance. But for now, the little that we can even do, these women are working, they are trading, they are blah blah. Explain to them that oh, if we are part of a savings group. At least this amount of money should be part of a how do you call it? And we should even push for le legislation for that. When you are paying in or when you are cashing in or whatever, ensure that these women have uh, access to these things and that they are they are, they are, they are being protected. So I am think talking about being proactive. Yes, we deal with government, etc. But also, how can we be more proactive? And I think we really need to work with the social services. You know, uh, whether it's Waju or Dovsu, etc., etc. Make sure that that information is there so that when women are going through something, they don't feel that uh, this is the only option. They can realize how that they too can become resilient. They too can own and they too can save for a rainy day so that uh, their problems, they come down. Because all of us are suffering from it and the blood pressure. You get one person in one family, all these quarrels, all these fights, because the rest of the family members are poor. Excuse me to say, those of you who are rich. But I'm thinking, you know, almost 2 million people and 31 million, that is, that, that's unacceptable. That's horrifying. That's vulnerable, I mean, <laughs> very vulnerable, and the, the options are there. So this uh, calls for more discussions, this calls for a campaign, and I thank Ilapi for actually going out of their way to look at this very important issue, and we'll, I've been talking to Bismarck on how we'll be able to go forward next year and talk more about it, so thank you very much. My next one goes to Ms. Um, Ofebia Ramatu. I would like to... Would like to take your take on that. Okay. So my last question will go to lawyer Nubo. Is it feasible to do away with customary successes? No, it is not. And honestly, I wouldn't even advise it because the system of customary successor is a way that orderliness is brought to the family unit. Of course, there are challenges. We should work at resolving those challenges once again through education. But honestly, it is, it is impossible for us to legislate away the customary successor. It's just not possible. Thank you. Sure. Um, I would take a last comment from Ni, uh, Chief of Otinish. Otino, yes, and then we'll wrap up the session. Please permit me to introduce Dr. Richard Abre. He's a theologian and policy research expert with Locus on Governance and Development. Kindly give us a wave if you're here. Dr. Richmond Abe, that's what I see. I'm sorry, that's what they were calling. Apologies. Thank you very much. Akago. Ago. Permit me to use my local language since my people are also here. Uh, I think I can, the subject you know, of discussion is very important in the life of every Ghanaian because. Um, I have been a victim of some of these things. And when it comes to those things, uh, a lot of family people go through difficult times. I realize that okay, we are all talking about education, education. Where do we start from? And how do we do it? I believe that okay, the youth or the children are our future leaders. And we have to start from there. We should add some of these things into our educational syllables. Start right from the classrooms, our communities. We should give it to the queen mothers, 
the opinion leaders in our communities, our various family houses, we have to start education from there. By so doing it, it will bring a lot of reform and changes. A lot of people believe that I can, if you do your will, that means you are preparing to head towards your grave. They don't understand what goes on after this life. Sometimes you may have your will all right, but yet people will fight and fight and fight and fight. Because one way or the other, you did not disclose it to your children. I believe the best way to do your will is to call all your children and let them know what you have given them before you pass away. As I speak to you, I have my way prepared. Every year I keep on changing it. Based on my experience, I don't want any of my children to go through it. Along the line, I will make sure to open up to all my children and also to do a, a, a video version of it. <laughs> I'm talking from experience. Sure. I don't want any family interference. I have witnessed where someone passed away and his children were very young. And a family member who they asked to take over has taken all the property from the children. And they didn't want their children to go to school because when they go to school, they will acquire knowledge and take back their property. And they started killing them. Anyone who will show up is fixed. We don't want our children to go through it. So this subject is so important that we should not put it under the carpet. We should start, we can even form a club in our schools to educate our children in the various secondary schools and the universities and the all settings. And it will also help us. For the children to know their rights and what they have and what belong to them, families must know. Some of us who have about three, four wives, sometimes they don't want to disclose some of these things to their, because they are afraid to die. But one way or the other, you will die. You brought it upon yourself. You must organize your home before you go back to your maker. So that is where I'll rest my case. Thank you very much. God bless you. Sir. I think that's well summed up. Um, to keep it short, um, the children are the future leaders. So the question I was going to ask was, where are we starting the education from? And I think Ni has answered that. I've had a very interesting deliberation. I've enjoyed myself. I have learned a lot. I've taken home a lot. I believe you've also done the same. Thank you so much for availing yourself for this discussion. And like to repeat the words of the MP, let's not just leave it here. We are all change makers. So let's go with the word. Let's try to educate more people about what we've learned here. Let's learn to tell people to have wills in their lifetime. That that doesn't necessarily mean that they will die. My name is Eyua Dove, and thank you so much for your patience.